Hey guys, I'm with Mike Jamboretz of Jambo Sport Fishing. Recently, Mike did a seminar about deep water Chinook fishing. Mike specifically fishes the Nia Bay area. Mike, in this seminar, what should the folks really take away from the seminar as a whole? Learning how to get down where the fish are, period. You know, finding the bait, uh, fishing the area properly. Uh, it's all it's more hunting than it sometimes than it is just getting out there and trolling you gotta you gotta find out where you're gonna fish more than anything so weather systems really come into play in the nia bay area is very different than a lot of the other areas down our west coast of uh, washington state so what should these guys be looking for fishing that area well the thing that we've got up in the north coast is we've got features you know we've got uh, structure underwater that, that is not available anywhere on south of nia bay on the north coast We've got deep canyons because of the Montefuca Canyon and some of the others, that, and then prairies that come up out of those canyons. And all those places are rich places that, that gather bait, fish, whales, everybody. Everybody lives there. I like it. So guys, watch all four parts of this seminar so that you get the most information for going out at Nia Bay and fishing for that deep water Chinook. Thanks, you guys, from the club for having me up here. Uh, my name is Mike Jambretz, and, I, and uh, as you heard, I run a, a small charter sport, 50-footers. It's a 37-footer, but it's probably the biggest six-man boat in the fleet, so uh, very comfortable, very seaworthy. And uh, Mia Bay has is, is been a huge thing for me because I fished the Columbia River for a lot of years. Well, not a lot of years. I fished for like, uh, anyways, uh, Columbia River, I started fishing down there and, for sturgeon for a number of years, and then... Then I got dialed into the fall Chinooks down there and fished it so many days that pretty soon you start to recognize the color of the fish, the shape of the fish, the length of the fish. And when it, the first time I went to Nia Bay after five years on the Columbia River, fishing down in the estuary there, basically a buoy tan area, I uh, moved to Nia Bay because I, I did that when I was younger. I loved Nia Bay for kings and, uh, and cohos, but uh, went back up there and the first time I, I started fishing up there, my God, I, I recognize those Columbia River fish are swimming by Nia Bay, and I said, man, why am I going to go back there? These fish are fresher up here, right? So, yeah, it's a good, it's a good hit, you know. I so, borrowed that fish from a guy on my boat that caught that, okay? I don't catch fish, I just put the guys on the fish, right? Anyway, it was such a fat one, I had to do it. But uh, we're going to, you got blackmouth season coming up here in Puget Sound. It's huge, you know, because the lack of cohos, you guys... Everybody got ripped off on fishing this year, whether you were in the ocean or what, you know, we lost a whole month in the ocean this year. We didn't have June fishery. We didn't, basically didn't have August. We only went till the 21st, so. Uh, Puget Sound, you got, you know, you guys all felt it worse than we did out there. At least we got a little bit of a season. We got six weeks in or something, but, uh, but in here, you know, the no coho and a really short king season, but, but a good king season, you know. Those fish were hitting at Nia Bay. I knew you guys were gonna whack them when it opened and you guys did, everybody did pretty well, so. At any rate, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, fish in the ocean. I'm going to tell, I'm gonna talk a lot about technique and how to get down deep with the minimum amount of downriggers. And you know, I'll tell you why. It's all about tangles. But uh, all the techniques I talk about are going to be applicable to Puget Sound blackmouth. Okay? Even some of the same lures. Maybe a little smaller. But anyway. Okay. Ports on the Washington coast. Uh, there's the whole state starting from, uh, let's see if my lighter works here. Clear down here to Waco, uh, the Columbia River, all the way up here to Nia Bay. Those are the ports that we have to choose from. If you look real close, a little hard to see on the slide, slide here, but you have these canyons right here. They're a bit offshore, especially at Westport. But when you get up here, look at Nia, look at Nia Bay, where these, these canyons and structure are pretty darn close to the beach right there. So when you have structure like that, it's just, it's just a... a it just brings to life all the places where the herring will collect and they'll, they'll build up and it's just a, a sea of life right there. So I chose Nia Bay. Okay, why the north coast? A little hard to see this one too. Can you guys see this okay? Are we good? It's a little bit, a little bit weak. Uh, I have learned just from talking to people and, and being in the business for so long that the fish migrate out to the ocean and they do a big circle and they'll come back down. This is Vancouver Island here, right? They'll come down Vancouver Island, so they'll hit up here at Port Hardy, and as they come down the Tofino and Ucluelet and uh, Banfield, when you hear that they're at Tofino, you know that Banfield is going to turn on in the next couple of days. And so these fish are moving on the outside of the island.
primarily. Like 90% of them would go on the outside. Fish coming into Puget Sound, all, look at all the estuaries we have here. Look at all these watersheds. And you guys know how many rivers that dump into Puget Sound. There's a little, there's a, a certain percentage, maybe 10% go on the inside of the island. But if you're going to fish anywhere on the coast, like if you're fishing steelhead on a river, if you fish above the fork, a lot of those fi fish took a left at the fork. That's what happens right here. They take a left at this fork, they come into Puget Sound. The farther south you go, there's, there's, you've got Westport down here, Willapa. Every time you have a river uh, where the fish are going to take a left, they're going to break away. The farther south you go, the less fish you have to pick from, period. At Nia Bay, all these fish that are going to come into Puget Sound, all the ones that are coming all the way down to Columbia, the Willapa, it's going to be Westport, Willapa, all those fish that come down here are going to be right here. Is and oysters left? Is there oysters? <coughs> the fish, is there oysters left? Is that what you left? I'm sorry. I said, do the fish only turn left? Uh, the ones coming from the north, if they're heading south, they're going to take a left, right? Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, that's, that's geometry, right? OK. I knew there was going to be one heckler here tonight, so. The Salmon Highway that, that you're talking about, it could be just right out on the prairie, which we'll show, OK? That depends. Uh, the question is, what percentage are Columbia River fish when you're fishing out in the bay? It depends on where you fish. Okay, if you're fishing in the Straits, which we'll talk about, uh, they're probably offshore. yeah offshore. It uh, quite a few of them. Yeah. I think they're quite a few. As I said, when I was fishing down there, I, I got to recognize in the colors and the shapes. And when I started fishing offshore, coming from the, the Columbia River up to Nia Bay, I said, "Wow, these are the same fish." You know, so it, it's kind of funny on the Columbia. It, it each tide brings in a run of fish. There's a lot of tributaries to the Columbia River. Every one of those tributaries has their run of fish. It's almost like one day, every fish you catch is like 15 to 17 pounds. The next day, they're, they're 17 to 20 or something. And then they're back down to 13 to 15 or whatever. It's almost like every river's run comes in in a big group with, with that tide. North, north fish, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe so. OK, get moving here. Okay, fishing out of Nia Bay. So this is what we're going to talk about. Like I said, we're going to talk about Nia Bay a lot because that's my passion. But as I said, any of these techniques that I discuss, you guys can use them any fishery you go anywhere. Okay. So five main areas, as I said, uh, you have the straits. This is a great fishery for people that with smaller vessels, or let's just say you have a big vessel, but it's storming up. Okay, the straits is a, is a great place to fish. Uh, all the Puget Sound fish, all the estuaries that come into Puget Sound, whether it be the Snohomish system or you know, all the way up the Fraser River, those fish have to drive through the straits to get back in there. Okay, you, and you have a, a ability to, to ambush them on their way by. Okay, so that's one of the spots. Uh, when I say the beach, that's going to be a, a fishery. It's generally a shallow water fishery. I'll show that to you. Uh, North, we have Swisher Bank. I'm going to talk about that a lot because it's a really good fishery. It's consistent, it's solid, and there's a lot of fish there on a daily basis. South, uh, we'll talk about that. Compass Rose and the shark fin are kind of in the general same area, but what, we, what you'll see on the slide when I show the, uh, the shape of the continental shelf coming down, it's kind of running somewhat parallel to the, to the land mass, and all of a sudden at Compass Rose, it goes takes a west and goes out to this big flat prairie out there that's connected back to the land, uh, different than the prairie that's offshore across the canyon. But it kind of, it funnels the bait out there, everything kind of swoops out there and it's just, it's just really a, a, a place that's just alive with fish. Okay, west, the, the real prairie, okay, we'll show pictures of that. So in other words, these are the five places that if you were talking to your buddy and say, where are you going today? And I'm gonna go north, okay, you know where he's going. He says, I'm gonna go south, you kind of know where he's going. Okay, here they are on, on, the, on the map. You'll notice that Swisher Banks, the farthest north, there's Compass Rose down south and Prairie and so on. And look at the canyon here. See that canyon? That is Juan de Fuca Canyon. That's what separates. There's Compass Rose. There's that land mass I was just talking about. The uh, continental shelf coming down here, and then, then it, it moves way off to the west and, and forms this big flat spot out there. It's called Compass Rose because on a marine nautical chart, uh, you'll see the Compass Rose sitting right there about where the text is. Okay, fish in the straits. Most of the fishing is done from Tattoos Island to the west, back to Seal and Sail Rock to the, to the east. 
uh, Nia Bay is right here. You can see the harbor. There's the jetty going out to Wada Island. You don't have to very, go very far to get into some decent fishing. This is really good early on, like uh, June, June to early July, when those fish are heading to Puget Sound. The one you guys, you guys all whacked them here in, in the middle of July, right? When you guys opened up, and it was good fishing. They had to swim by here, and the fish will. A lot of the fish will come from the north. They'll actually go past this, and they'll kind of get confused, and they'll turn in, and they'll, they'll, they'll kind of follow this beach line. That's why over the years, like people talk about fishing mushroom rock and in on the kelp. For years, that, that, those, uh, the kelp fishery was awesome. You know, It's not as good as it used to be back in the, other, the old days, but anyway. So this is where you're going to do most of your fishing. Now, as I said, fishing in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, you're, you've got a pretty good protection. If it's kicked up, kicked up on the ocean, or let's just say you've got a, fish, uh, a boat that's under 20 feet, there's nothing wrong with staying inside and being safe. There's plenty of fish to be had. Okay, the best gear selection inside, uh, you've heard of matching the hats, right? When, when you go and fly fishing or whatever, trout fishing, it's no different with salmon. If you're going to fish inside, you're going to notice that a lot of the bait is small stuff. You're going to see little uh, anchovies and little uh, uh, sicklebacks and all kinds of goofy little, little guys. It, it, sometimes there's herring. They're like yearling herring. They're, they're like an inch long. And we scoop those once in a while, and we use them for bait on our hoochies. You don't have to fillet a piece off. You just stick the whole little herring on there. It's pretty awesome. But anyways, you're going to fish smaller uh, stuff, like so medium to small spoons. In other words, you're not going to fish anything over six inches in there because the bait's not that big. Okay? Uh, if you're going to fish a flasher and a hoochie combo, you're going to have a tendency to fish the candlefish the, uh, profile ones uh, versus the standard, you know, three-and-a-half-inch uh, uh, Hoochie's octopus style, okay? Herring rigs, once again, you're not going to fish big, like horse herring inside because the bait's small. So greens are less. Five-inch plugs, I, I don't fish anything bigger than five-inch, and I honestly don't fish that many plugs inside myself. I like to, I like to fish spoons and herring. Okay, there's a the difference in the profile. There's your standard three-and-a-half-inch Hoochie, and there's your the candlefish version. You can see that the... Pre the profile is a lot narrower, more like the, like if you're going to fish, let's say you're going to fish blackmouth at a mid-channel bank, there's a lot of candlefish up there. You're going to fish that over that, okay? Or, you know, whatever your color choice is, but you can do better on the, on the smaller stuff. Okay. Hey yes. On the, the candlefish? Yeah. I would fish a couple of number fives, or excuse me, five aughts. I tie them in, in series there, you know, one, one up, one down, okay? Make sure when you tie them, you got, they're orient, oriented where they naturally lay, one up, one down. Mm -hmm. I learned that years ago, steelhead fishing, you don't tie them to where they're both pointing the same way. You can get more hookups with opposing hooks, okay? Well, thank you. Yep. All right. So uh, another, another one of the fisheries you can do, question real quick? Can you back up on just a second? I never heard that before. On the hooks? Yeah, on the hooks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. The question was, he's, he said he's never heard about the, the hook orientation, which I just talked about briefly. Basically what I'm doing, uh, I tie my own hooks. I'm sure a lot of you guys do as well. You tie that first hook and let it lay naturally in, in, your, in your hand. When you slide the next hand, the hook down, set your spacing however you want your spacing. I usually on a hoochie, I'll just get them to where the, 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 the round part of the hook's almost touching the eye of the second one. That's the way I do it. Get them really close, but not clanking. But at any rate, lay that second hook where it'll naturally, when you start tying it, it's going up, and that one's rolling down. Then when you tie it, let it, let it lay, make sure it's laying naturally, and you'll have opposing hooks. If a fish is going to bite, and they're both pointing down, it's, it's just fish, you know, fish, fish have always got the advantage of over us. They're, sometimes they just don't hook. So why not set it up to where you're going to get the best advantage to get a hook up, okay? So one up, one down, okay? Okay, if you're going to tie, I'll tell you a real trick here. If you're going to wrap your leaders around a foam like this, if you have one hook up and one hook down, you're going to, they both have to push put down to get into this foam, right? So what I do is I do a, a, a wrap and a half before I stick it in. So I'm twisting that line about a wrap and a half before I, but before I stick the second hook in the foam. That way, when it comes out, hopefully it'll be pointing the right way. It doesn't have to be 180. If it's at least 90, you know, at least you're at least you're not having them both go the same way. Okay, moving moving along here. 
So here we are, uh, Nia Bay's back here. Coitla Point right here is, uh, is right at the, the uh, jetty that goes out to, uh, to Wada Island starts right there. So Nia Bay's back in here. You've got all this uh, kelp and rock and structure here. If you're gonna fish this on an incoming tide, you've got Duncan Rock out here. You've got Tattoo Island, you've got Jones Rock. All that tide's gonna be coming in hard. There's arrows showing it. So it's gotta get around that, around that land mass or rocks or whatever the structure is. So one of the things that you're gonna, you're gonna learn by uh, listening to me tonight is I do not go against the tide. I will sometimes go across it, but not very often. I'm usually going with the tide, okay? So here you got a scenario where you got a lot of water coming in around these rocks. It's deep out here, it's shallow there, it accelerates. It has to come in, it's coming in pretty fast at you. I will generally, if I'm gonna fish an incoming tide in the straits, there's a couple places I will start. Uh, right there is one of them. If you basically go up here by Duncan Rock and, and fish across, here's a scenario where I will fish across the tide, kind of set up the wall of death. Here they come, right? You wanna have your gear coming across the, the, the entrance right there. Then I'm gonna go across from there. And, and I'm gonna head in an, in an angle like this from the, we call it stinky rock right out here. It's where all the sea lions hang out and, and uh, they don't use the restroom. They just, you know, where they sleep, okay? So kind of stinky on, a, on, the, on the wrong wind. Anyways, as you pass that stinky rock, you're gonna be aiming for over here on this point, but you're gonna to have to crab, you're gonna to to point your bow this way to end up there because it's gonna push you there anyway. Okay, come across there and there you go. I just kind of meander your way in there as, as, as close and as, that you feel comfortable with your downriggers out. I like about 40 feet on the downriggers when I'm doing that. And uh, when you get up to the end here, I don't know if you saw that, but it showed danger right here. You get about that far, it's time to pick up and run back and do it again, okay? And that's, what, that's the way you fish it. It's pretty productive. You don't have a problem with black yeah. sea bass when you go next to it? What's that? You don't have problems with the sea bass when you get in Okay, there? the question is, do you have problems with sea bass? The answer is yes. Okay, especially fish and small lures, the, they're gonna bite, you know. It's just part of the game, you know. If it's open for sea bass, if you're fishing within the 120 uh, foot line or the 20 fathom line, you can keep them. So why not? We do. Yep. Okay guys, that was a lot of great information that was in part one. Make sure you move on to part two of this four part series so that you'll get more information about the locations and Mike's gonna start talking about using your downriggers for fishing Chinook.